I got some mail this week. Some special mail, actually, this Thanksgiving week. Um, I got a letter from the service manager at our local Ford dealership. He says he really wants to buy my 2009 Ford Edge. Uh, he knows me well enough to know I would really prefer to have a new vehicle, and he wants my super special 2009 Edge so much he's willing to pay me top dollar for it and give me a deep discount on a brand new Ford. And I think with care and attention like that, is it any wonder that I'm a Ford truck guy? <laughs> oh. <I> all... <laughs> that is an interesting twist to this. Yeah. I also got mail from eBay this week. eBay, you know eBay? eBay noticed that I had been looking at ground blinds for deer hunting. And they noticed that I looked, but I didn't actually buy one. But they know that I would really like to have one, and so they extended a very special arrangement to me, saying all I need to do is just make an offer. And I am so, I feel so cared for that um, I just think it feels really great to be cared for in such a special way. I also got these letters in the mail this week. These are handwritten letters by some elementary schoolers in our congregation. And this letter says, um, Dear Pastor Lance, um, thank you for all you do, like spending your Sundays teaching us about God. Yeah. Hmm. This one I taped to my bookshelf this week. Yeah. And I got this one this week. This is, Dear Pastor Lance, thank you for being a fun pastor. I love going to Chestnut Grove. It even has a picture. This one might get framed for my wall. Thank you for being a fun pastor. It's official. Of all the mail I got this week, um, some of it was the product of a well-fashioned marketing campaign designed to increase brand recognition maybe grow market segment, increase profits, and using flattery even to do those things. Some of the mail that I got this week, there was no profit to be had. There was no brand to try to expand. It was just a person attempting to connect in a way that demonstrated gratitude and appreciation and love. This week's Bible text is that kind of mail. Let's open back to the book of Ephesians, which is actually a letter that Paul wrote to some people that he loved. Ephesians chapter 1 is where we're looking today, and I encourage you to turn there in your Bibles because we're going to read some sections of this together, and it'll be important that you're looking where I'm pointing so that we can see some things together this week. Today's Bible passage is that kind of mail. Um, this section in the letter to the Ephesians is, is a thanksgiving prayer. Now, Paul writes uh, thanksgiving prayers in most of his letters. It's one of the first two elements, usually, in the things that he writes. This one's a little bit different today, but um, it's a, it's a two-section prayer of thanksgiving. You heard Brittany read it a moment ago. And this thanksgiving prayer... The first part of it, the first section of it, is thanking the Ephesians or, or offering gratitude or thanks for the Ephesians for what Paul had heard about them. It's kind of the word on the street that Paul had heard about the Ephesians. And he says, you know, I've heard, I, I do not cease giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I'm thankful because I've heard of what? And what is it that Paul has heard about this community of people in Ephesus? He's heard about their love, and he's heard about their faith. These are things that Paul has just heard about this community. It's the word on the street about them. And it left me wondering this week, Chestnut Grove, what have people heard about our community? What do people think of? Like, What's the word on the street 
about you? Do people think about you and they think, oh, those are the people who trusted God enough to take a chance to open a retail store in town called the Earliesville Exchange. And now those people, they've given $250,000 to local partners in our area. Is that what they think of when they hear about us? Is that the word on the street, you think? Or do they think about us and they think, oh, that's the congregation that birthed a new initiative to care for all of the military families in our whole region because they care about military families. So they started living free together. Is that what, is that what they think of when they think about us? Or do they think, hey, that is the community of people that loves all of our neighbors so much that they're tutoring all of our neighborhood children in, ele in the elementary school locally. That's that kind of people. That's what I've heard about them. Or is the word on the street about us that we're the people who built a $100,000 missional playground and pavilion, pickleball court and basketball court, so that all the families in our whole community have a place to connect with each other and recreate or recreate together. Is that the word on the street about us? Or is what they hear, oh, that's the congregation that oh, about this time every year they put hay bales all around town in order to try to cultivate a spirit of hope and love and peace and joy. Is that the word about us in town? I don't know for sure. But I do know we spend, all, we spend almost zero time trying to brand ourselves. Is we spend almost no time or energy marketing. We don't use our church logo in any attempt to gain market share of churchgoers. We're not trying to build our brand, so we don't market in the same way that our local, <laughs> our local dealerships do. Because I think that the word on the street or the word in our community about us or an actual experience among us is a truer tell about who we are as a community. Paul had heard some things about the community at Ephesus, and he couldn't stop giving thanks because of the things he had heard about who those people are. In Chestnut Grove, I want to tell you that when I experience your love for all the people in this community, and when I behold the faith that you have in God, I join Pastor Paul, and giving thanks for what I've heard about you and what I see in you. Paul's beginning of his Thanksgiving prayer is about the things he has heard or seen or encountered among this community, and it seems like a really great beginning of a Thanksgiving prayer to give thanks for this community, and I want to join him in giving thanks for this community based on what I see among you and in you. But then there's the second section of this prayer, and this is what I think turns it into a good Thanksgiving week prayer. Because Thanksgiving doesn't have just one holiday, does it? It has two built in, right? What is the day after Thanksgiving? How many of us are Black Friday participants? <laughs> Katina, this is for you. <laughs> now, at worst, at worst, Black Friday is this expanding period of time in which we are feverishly focused on what's missing from our lives. It is the nemesis and polar opposite of gratitude, this focus on what we don't have. But a better version of Black Friday has participants attending to what our loved ones are missing. And so we think about how can we help our loved ones have a more complete existence of some sort. But I think that a perfected Black Friday would have its participants thinking about all of the best realities of the universe and wanting those realities for all the people on the planet. I think that would be a perfected Black Friday. And it would be the product of a gratitude that was being perfected. Out of this deep gratitude, I want the very best for the whole planet, all the people, all God's children. Paul's Thanksgiving week prayer has an element of that kind of longing. He's made a list of things that he wants 
for his friends at Ephesus. And he writes them in this prayer, these are the things on my shopping list for you. These are the things I'm longing for for you. I want you to have the very best thing. I give thanks for what I've heard about you. You have faith and you have love, but here's some other things I want for you, things that will help you be who you really could be and can be. And so this is the second part of the Thanksgiving prayer. Let's read it together, shall we? I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. These are the things that Paul wants for this congregation, for his friends at Ephesus, the renowned New Testament and theology professor, Feme Perkins. is also the writer of the New Interpreter's Bible Commentary. She wrote that the thanksgivings of Paul's letters often signal themes that he takes up in what follows. This second long periodic sentence in Ephesians serves that function. When Paul is giving thanks, he often kind of foreshadows the things he's going to pick up later in his letters. And in today's text, he does exactly that. He kind of tips his hand at the things that he's going to talk about, that he wants for this community at Ephesus. So what were those things that Paul wants for that community? Well, look at this. I circled them, actually, so we could see together what is it that he says he wants. He wants God to give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that with the eyes of their hearts enlightened, they may, A, know what's the hope to which God has called you. Oh, let's go back. The hope to which he's called you. Or, yeah, yeah, okay, the hope to which he's called you. The riches of this inheritance among the saints and the immeasurable greatness of God's power. That's God's working out this power. These are Paul's like Black Friday list of things he's longing for. This is what Paul really wants for these people that he cares about. And so I thought, well, let's just take a look at what Paul says about these things that he wants for these people. He knows they have faith. He knows they have love for all God's people, but apparently there's more. He wants them to understand this hope to which they've been called. I want that for us too, I think. So let's look, what does Paul say about this hope that he longs for his folks to understand? So next slide. The hope to which he has called you. Now, if you would turn in your Bibles over to chapter 2, which is verse 11, it's the next page. And I'm just going to give you a little prelude here, this hope. The way I understand is that this hope is that in Christ, God takes all of the people who are really close to God and all of the humans that are estranged from God, far away, distant, enemies, they're rebel, rebelling, rebel, rebels, rebel, hmm, they're opponents <laughs> of God. He takes all the people that are close to God and all the people who are rebelling against God and in Christ, he brings them together. And then he redeems them all to God. One new humanity, he says. That's the hope that he wants Ephesus to know about. That that's the kind of God that this is. I want him to know the hope. So let's look here. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this little section. You can follow along in the Bibles there at your seats. I'm going to start with verse 11, and I'm going to go through verse 21. So then, Ephesus, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision. Now, just a quick background. In Paul's day, God's people were the Jewish people and everyone else were the Gentiles, the goyim. There's like the in crowd with God and then there's everybody else. There's the in crowd with God and then there's all the goyim, the riffraff, the enemies, the, the opponents, those who are rebelling against God. It was pretty simple. There's just two groups. You're either in with God or you're not. And what Paul says here is, 
Remember, at one time, you Gentiles by birth, you were a part of this crowd over here. Remember, remember that. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Woo! You're fully outside of God's good graces here. And strangers to the covenants of promise, having no what? You had no hope. That's the thing Paul wants for them, right? Hope. There was a time you had no hope. You were without God in the world, but, this is a big but, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace in his flesh. He has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. He's abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one, in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. Whew. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Friends, is that a pretty big vision, a big dream? Holy moly! Is that a bigger idea than, oh, I get to go to heaven someday? All of humanity being built into one new humanity, being reconciled to each other and being reconciled to God, that is the thing Paul, that's the hope that Paul wants Ephesus to see. It's such a bigger thing than I get to go to heaven someday. It's God's doing this thing with all humanity, putting them together, taking the hostilities away. One new humanity. Whew, that's a big hope. That's what Paul wants on this Black Friday. Who wants that? How many of us would like to have some of that? Now, I know some of you are saying, no, no, no. I learned there are insiders and there are outsiders. And unless you do it exactly like this, you can't be in. Mm, that is just not the spirit of this prayer. Paul longs for this bigger picture, bigger even than you knew. That's the hope he's longing for. Whew, that's a pretty good longing for. I want him to want that for me. <laughs> that's the hope. But that's not all. He wants the eyes of the Ephesians, to be opened, that they might begin to see that, yeah? So that they may begin to taste the hope of that reality. But there's more. He then goes on to pray that the Ephesians might awaken to what Paul calls the riches of this inheritance. Inheritance. Who gets an inheritance? People who are left behind, members of the family. Another word for that is heirs, right? Heirs are who receive the inheritance. Paul says, I want you to know the riches of this inheritance. So let's flip over this time to chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. In Ephesians, here Paul is talking something about what is this? And that is that in Christ, these enemies over here have become heirs. Whew. Here we go. Verses 5 through 9, chapter 3. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow what? Heirs. Who gets an inheritance? Heirs. Who are the heirs he's talking about? The enemies. The Gentiles have become fellow heirs 
members of the same body and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant, Paul says, according to the gift of God's grace that was given me, the gift of God's grace that was given me, the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Coming back to that in a minute. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the what? Boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Friends, there is an inheritance at hand. It is bigger than you thought where the enemies are included. Paul wants Ephesus to taste this hope that there's a future where there aren't enemies because you can't have enemies when there's one new humanity. You know what makes an enemy? In part, <laughs> calling them them. Calling them not included. Calling them outsiders. Calling them degenerates. Calling them whatever name to build enemies, like letting them know that they don't belong, right? If you do that long enough, you'll build up a really, really strong rebellious movement against you. you just keep telling them that they're, they don't belong, that they're outsiders, that they're not part. Paul says, no, 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 no. See, there's this inheritance. And the inheritance that comes in Christ is that everybody is an heir. Even the Gentiles. Even the Gentiles. That's a big idea, isn't it? Such a big idea. Paul oh, prays in this Thanksgiving week prayer for some things. He prays they might awaken to the hope that comes in Christ for one new humanity. He prays that they might awaken to the inheritance that is already theirs. That the Gentiles are included in this thing. That's what Christ is up to here. Whew, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good, pretty good note. Pretty good letter. Okay, but there's more. Um, Paul also prays that. Ephesus would begin to experience God's power, this glorious power. Now, I should let you know, today is actually the last Sunday of the church year. Did you know that? Today is Reign of Christ Sunday, or Christ the King Sunday. Uh, it's really important to me that we don't speed past this on the way to Christmas land, because today is the big finale of the year. It's the year that we focus on what does it mean that Christ is the king? What does it mean that he reigns or that he has power? What is this power that we're talking about when we talk about Christ? Is it just that some of us get to go to heaven? Not most of us, just some of us. Or is there a bigger thing going on here? What is this Christ power at hand that includes this hope of one new humanity, that includes this inheritance that is already inclusive of the Gentiles as heirs of this thing, the outsiders? So he talks about the greatness of God's power. Now, some of you say, yeah, I know God is great. Lance, I read the story where God created. And I read the story um, where God divided the sea in order to help slaves escape. I read the stories of all the things like Jesus. You know, he took broken bodies and he uh, healed those people. It was rare and only on occasion, we might say. But he did it. That's what God's power is. Paul here, he says, oh, this power is really greater than you even thought. I want you to know this power that is at work in the world even right now. It's not rare or select. It's not just specialized in only very certain cases. This power is at hand. It's been on display in ways that you can see, but this is the power I want you, I want you to experience it. How many of you would like to experience a little bit of God's power? Whew, me too. But it's important that we recognize, well, what is God-like power? What is God's power? And what isn't a kind of power that is of God? Because friends, there's a lot of kinds of power in this world. Well, here Paul seems to want to give him a little clarity about the kind of power that he's talking about. So I want you to know, Paul says, I want you to know the greatness of God's power. So let's look at chapter 6 on this one. Now, chapter 6 is all about power. It's about kind of over-under power. It's about how 
parents are powerful over their children. It's about how masters are powerful over their slaves. But there's this other kind of power here that Paul talks about. Now, he even talks about um, the, the full armor of God, right? And he uses a soldier as the metaphor. The soldier where you have like this breastplate and this shield and this helmet and a sword and all these things. But here's what's so interesting. Even though he uses the metaphor of a soldier, he's going to say that God's power is not about domination over other people. It's not about violent, militaristic conquering, ever. It does something else, this power of God. So he uses this metaphor, but then he redefines what it is to have a sword and a shield and a helmet and a breastplate and a belt and all the bravado things of a soldier. He says, yeah, but Paul's so interesting here in what he does because he says, yeah, it's not so that you can conquer things. It's so that you can withstand the cosmic forces and powers, the spiritual things in this world. It's so that you can stand and keep holding on to those things. Let's read just verse 10 through 13. Finally, Paul says in closing the whole letter and the third part of this prayer, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything, to stand firm. Friends, God's power is not the power of militaristic domination. God's power is a power that breathes life into dead places. God's power is a place that breathes healing into broken places. God's power isn't about our mighty righteousness dominating over other people, groups, or powers. God's power is about breathing life into the broken places between us. God's power isn't about making sure the good guys win and the bad guys get scorched earth. God's power is about making one new humanity out of all of those people and redeeming them all, not only to each other, but to God too. Paul says that to the letter, uh, in his letter to the Romans that God's power is the power to give life to the dead and call into existence things that do not yet exist. And I'm going to suggest that one new humanity is one of those possibilities. God's power isn't the power to conquer, defeat, and destroy other people. God's power is the power to bring them together and to take away the things that kept them apart in the first place. To breathe into the world one new humanity, healed, redeemed, repaired. Ooh, I'm so hopeful about that. Friends, this is a pretty good Black Friday list of things that he wants for that community. This prayer this longing that he has. He prays they might understand hope. It's a big hope. He prays that they might recognize, oh, there's already an inheritance and you're already an heir. You don't have to work for it. There's no hoops. You've been written in as an heir of this promise. He wants them to understand the kind of power that doesn't dominate or destroy other people groups. It's the kind of power that turns them into sisters and brothers. Power of life and aliveness, not death or deadliness. Well, friends, I got mail this week, I told you. I got some mail from the marketing efforts of corporations that feign care in order to get my loyalty and probably ultimately my money. And I got some other mail this week, mail that simply longs to make a connection Share how much this person appreciates you, this community. It's the kind of mail that Paul wrote. In fact, this is like Bible stuff right here. It's a Pauline-type letter. I give thanks for you. 
I love this place, he says. But I got one other piece of mail this week. And this is from a 16-year-old that I don't know yet. Let's go one more. This is the final piece of mail. And it's from a person, I'm not going to share the name because I don't, we'll just call this person S. It's a 16-year-old male, I think. And this person writes, hello, my name is S. I'm 16 years old, and I've never been to church before, but have taken interest in learning about God and Christianity. My parents never have gone to church, so I've always been nervous to go, as weird as that may sound. I'm not even quite sure how to begin reading the Bible or how to go to church or things of that nature. Forgive me if I sound uninformed, but I'm truly interested in Christianity and feel God in my life every day. Whew. I don't know this young man, or I don't know what he's heard about you. But apparently he's heard something about you as a community that makes this 16-year-old boy feel comfortable making an honest and humble appeal on how this boy might get connected with the God of the universe. What good mail. So, maybe he's heard about your faith or your love. Maybe he's played pickleball or basketball out here. I don't know. Maybe he shops every week at the Earliesville Exchange. Maybe his parent is a veteran who participates in Living Free. I'm not sure. But he's heard something about you. And so my thanksgiving prayer for this young guy this week is that we might be able to introduce him to this big hope and might show him that he's already an heir of an inheritance that is already his. And that we might introduce him to a kind of power that comes from God that breathes new life into lifeless places. And that's my thanksgiving prayer for my hopeful new friend named S. I pray that we might show him those things at the same time that you and I are together experiencing more opened eyes to see the hope of Christ, to bring all humanity back together as one new humanity, that you and I might experience all together in a way that he can see this power of God to bring life and to breathe life into the dead places inside of us and among us and between us. That's my thanksgiving prayer. Amen. God, I suspect that residents of most kingdoms throughout history have not been able to fully understand the mind of the king. And likewise, we confess that you as our king have bigger ideas than we're aware of. We thank you for things like scripture and creation that reveal you. so that we have an increasing capacity to see as the eyes of our hearts are continually opened to bigger and bigger ideas. Thank you for the capacity to feel thanksgiving and at the same time to have longing. And I pray that you will adjust our own hearts longing. We might be taking of the things of your kingdom. Thanks for loving us without limit. And thanks for loving all humanity limitlessly. It's in Jesus that we say thanks. It's in his name that we pray and sing. Amen.